Welcome to session two of the 2021 UPRT Safety Summit for Professional Pilots Worldwide. My name is Paul B.J. Ransbury. I'm the CEO of Aviation Performance Solutions, and it's my great honor today to be the host of this session with Sonny Bates. Sonny is going to be talking about the LOCI bow tie, unraveling the risk of loss of control on flight. Sonny is the CEO of Wyvern and has extensive experience. It's very relevant to the topic today. In fact, I can't think of a better fellow out in the industry to talk about this. And he has such a wonderful way of presenting complex concepts very simply. So a little bit about Sonny before I bring him in here, he's just standing by on the sidelines, is that Wyvern, uh, of which Sonny is a CEO, is a global leader in elevating aviation safety and security. Sonny started his career in the US Air Force where he was an instructor pilot, an examiner, a flight commander, a C-5 Galaxy commander, and a C-17 safety program manager. In business aviation, he has functioned as a chief pilot, safety manager, and been a captain on various business jet aircraft. He's a safety leader, and he was the program director for the International Business Aviation Council or IBAC with 700 operators worldwide. Currently, he is the vice chairman of the MBAA Business Aviation Management Committee. And it's just a wonderful honor to spend some time here with uh, Sonny today. And so without any further ado, let's go ahead and hand it over to you, Sonny. Take it from here. Thank you, BJ, for that uh, introduction. And so now we're going to uh, go over the presentation I have uh, named Unraveling the Risk of Loss of Control in Flight with Bowtie. So first is like, what is the bow tie method? You can see from this picture that um, at like 10,000 feet, looking at it, um, on the left side, you have things that cause um, undesired states. And we commonly call these threats or hazards. And what we do is we, we, we list these threats or hazards, and then in between them and the upset event, we put controls in place or barriers. But let's say the hazard of the threat penetrates through the barriers and puts us in the upset, upset state. Now we find ourselves on the right side of the equation and we need to be ready for that moment. And, uh, and so on the right side of a bow tie, you, you list um, the potential outcomes and, and then barriers of protection to, to basically lessen the severity of those outcomes. So the bow tie beginnings, where, where did the bow tie come from anyway? Um, researchers tell us that uh, bow, di bow tie diagram showed up in a lecture on hazard analysis in the University of Queensland in about 1979. So, so they really haven't been around very long. Um, when did they, when did the bow tie actually, you know, become adopted into industry? Well, after the Piper Alpha platform explosion uh, in the North Sea in 1988, where 167 people lost their lives, the investigation team uh, found that really the company uh, had little understanding of hazards and risks. So as a result, uh, by the 90s, Royal Dutch Shell Group adopted the bow tie method as a way to formally analyze and manage risk. So what is it? What, what, what are the bow tie elements? Um, when you look at the bow tie, uh, knowing that its background came from the energy sector, um, and you can imagine a bunch of uh, engineers putting this together, um, you know, to analyze hazards. It, it, it was well designed for, for that purpose. You know, you had a hazard at the very top, which might be a natural gas. And the top event is the release of the natural gas. You don't want that to be released. You want to contain it. And so on the left side, there's threats that could lead to the release of the natural gas. And then there are controls put in place to, to mitigate those threats. Um, so you see the threat there in the blue box. You see the controls put in place. There's different, um, you see, uh, different color coding. You know, the nice thing about bow ties, you can make it how you want to. But the nice thing is that looking at this right now, you can see that a bow tie can give you a complete picture of a specific hazard. What could cause a bad outcome, these threats on the left side, what we're doing about it to contain these threats. And then what happens on the right side, just in case, you know, the containment is not effective. How do we respond to this, this upset, you know, situation? Um, so on the right side, the consequences have their controls in place. You see a, a box there on the bottom left, the escalation factor. Uh, the, the, the purpose of the escalation factor is 
they, it, it's addressing the reality that not all controls are perfect. Controls have their weaknesses. So it points out the weakness of a specific control and then asks the question, well, what are you doing to control that? So um, this is it. It's really not more than this, but as we look on how to apply the bow tie, especially in aviation, not in the, um, you know, the energy uh, industry, it, it, um, it can be very helpful. Now, this is a chart that's like one of the worst charts you'd ever see. Uh, you don't want to ever do this when you're designing a PowerPoint slideshow. But I did it anyway because it, it, it gives you a sense of what it looks like at the bow tie from, from a high level. What you're looking at here is Flight Safety Foundation's BARS program, which is the basic aviation risk standard. They used the bow tie methodology to analyze basic risk because the BARS was designed for the energy sector and, um, and for aviation. And so it's applicable. And, and more than that, what makes this applicable is these parts I've highlighted, I'm gonna expand on them so you can actually read them. But on the left side, you have a list of basic hazards, there's sort of like a number of them, like 12. In the part I've highlighted this a vertical column are common risk controls. And then the horizontal that I've highlighted are your loss control and flight specific risk controls. And as you can see over here, just by looking at the picture, there's an upset uh, moment there. It looks like the, 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 the bang, the red bang. And on the right side of that are potential uh, outcomes or, or um, barriers to, to reduce the severity of these outcomes. So let's, let's zoom in now so you can actually read this. So basic um, uh, bars, basic threats can include runway excursions, fuel exhaustion. I'm not gonna read them all to you, but look, one, two, three, about number five down there on the list is uh, loss of control and flight. So it is one of, uh, of the, 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 the basic threats out there to all aviation. Um, BARS also lists common controls, um, which are applicable to just about any threat. Um, and I'm not going to read all these to you, but you can see that number one is safety, leadership, and culture. Um, if you have a healthy safety culture, you have effective leadership, this is going to enable you to address a, a number of threats and hazards in your organization effectively. But you can see down through there that, you know, uh, training, equipment, uh, crew duty time, uh, maintenance duty time, all these are basic, are these are common controls for, for, for basic risks in aviation. So let's look at uh, loss of control in flight. Um, now, the, the top part, the caption there is taken straight from Flight Safety Foundation. And by the way, the Flight Safety Foundation Basic Aviation Risk Standard or BARS is something you can download for free uh, off the Flight Safety Foundation website. It doesn't cost you anything. Um, and so we use it in our company to help analyze basic risk for, for any company we, we um, uh, audit, let's say. So when you look at these controls for loss control and flight, uh, to prevent it from happening, um, BARS offers these, uh, automation policy. This is to make sure that your pilots use automation in a way that's meaningful, but not over rely on automation to where they lose the pilot skills. Um, Multi-crew operations. This is to enforce the idea that uh, two pilots are better than one. If you have two pilots on the flight deck, then there's less chance of maybe having an upset uh, situation. A CRM training, aeronautical decision-making training, uh, FOQA, LOSA, all these things are in there. What's not in there yet, and, uh, and it should be added, and I'm personally working uh, to, to do what I can to get this added, I think that UPRT, um, should be added to this list as a preventative measure to, to successfully mitigate the risk of an upset, uh, upset uh, in flight. So creating our own bow tie. You can make your bow tie look whatever you want. So I've taken some liberty here to just create a, a fundamental bow tie that says, look, we have a number of things that could lead to an upset in flight. Some of them are environmental. It could be turbulence, uh, clear air turbulence. It could be wind shear, uh, weight turbulence from another airplane. You could have a systems anomaly, uh, whether it be your autopilot or flight control, um, or pilot-induced, maybe inattention, maybe distraction. But all these things um, are threats that could lead to an upset. Common controls, I've already listed those on a previous slide, but that's those are the barriers that prevent you from being in the upset situation. 
but let's say they're not effective. Let's say you find yourself in the upset situation. The only thing really that you might have after that, so you're, you're, in, you're in an unusual attitude of flight or an upset, um, it could lead to a fatal accident, which we know this is uh, the number one killer in aviation. It might not be the number one uh, 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 statistic for accidents in general, but for fatal accidents, it is loss of control of flight. So what are we doing about it? You could have controls like, you know, maybe the Cirrus aircraft have the parachute system, but most airplanes don't have that. Um, or in the future, maybe an automatic recovery system where the, the flight deck and avionics are so smart, it senses the unusual attitude or the upset and it recovers for you. We don't have that yet. What we do have right now is upset prevention and recovery training. And that is the one pathway that can bring you back to a safe recovery, to a normal flying state. So that's really it, Randy. I just wanted to, and, and BJ, I wanted to, to share with you, um, you know, using the bow tie to analyze uh, the upset uh, prevention and recovery, uh, how it is actually addressed right now by the Flight Safety Foundation and the Basic Aviation Risk Standard, and, and how we're working uh, to, to make sure that UPRT gets added as one of the fundamental ways to prevent uh, this occurrence, and even better, um, if it happens, you can successfully recover the situation and come home safely. Um, that's my presentation, and it's back to you, BJ. Well, Sonny, thank you so much for that great presentation. It's, uh, it's always good to, to have you here. So. Um, we got quite a number of people online today, several hundred I'm seeing on our, our LinkedIn Live site that I'm hoping we're going to get some questions. So I encourage uh, everybody out there to ask any questions you have of Sunny and the Bowtie concept related to loss of control and flight. Uh, Sunny, any comments before we start into a few questions? Because I have a couple for you. Okay. Um, really, uh, just, just a couple. Um, one is, you know, I find it um, interesting that, you know, when I speak to people out in the industry about um, any basic threats to aviation, most are still unaware of the BARS standard, the basic aviation risk standard. And I think some of that is to do that, that you know, we focus on the business aviation community at Wyvern. It's not our only community, um, but there is quite a focus on it to include air charter and so forth. And because most people understand BARS to be, you know, for the energy sector and, and it is used quite extensively by them um, we're missing out on the benefits of this standard in business aviation so i encourage everyone to go on flight safety foundation's website download the bar standard and see what it could do for you um, it, it highlights basic aviation risk to include you know uh, collision in the air collision on the ground uh, runway excursions like you saw in the presentation but also to the point here of this presentation lost control in flight and um, there's, there's much to be learned from, from that document and, and it's, it's free to download. That, that, that's one comment I'd like to make. And I, and I guess the other one is, you know, uh, most people haven't heard of bow tie. Most people probably will not use the bow tie, but if you're in the business of safety risk management, even though it was designed by a bunch of engineers um, decades ago, that, that this technique, um, bow tie is a wonderful way just to scribble on a piece of paper. If you're just using pen and paper, um, you know, threats on one side, barriers. Okay, this is what we don't want to happen, but it happened. What are you going to do about it to lessen the severity? And it gives you one picture to really look at a complex situation all in one sheet. Um, and so I encourage you to at least, you know, give it a try. Yeah, I really like, I had never actually seen the concept myself, Sunny, until you presented it. And we're like, wow, Sunny communicates so clearly on these com complex concepts. But it really is, to your point, you could sit down on a napkin with a pencil and sketch something out to address pretty much anything. And I really like the, the, the controls concept is, you know, managing the controls. And to your point, you made in your, your video that they're not always perfect either, but that at least can isolate the area to improve when you're trying to mitigate something. So we do have a couple of questions coming in, but uh, before we go to those, the first one, um, we so one of the things that it's difficult to accept in the industry is the fact that essentially our regulatory and certification training we have now has established loss of control and flight as the number one threat to air safety. And of course, the purpose of this event and all the organizations around the world to take action on this is try to mitigate it. So the, the first question I have for you, Sunny, 
is uh, why doesn't the regular simulator training that we already conduct count on the right side of the bow tie as a mitigation? That's a good question, BJ. And, and if it's done properly, it could. Um, the problem is it's really not a controlled training event. And what I mean by controlled, the quality of the training event is, is, is very um, uh, uh, unstandard, non-standard. Uh, you probably know from your own experience, I know I do, even from my Air Force experience all the way up to all through the civilian training, when I get in the simulator, it's up to the instructor to say, oh, yeah, we need to check another box. Um, close your eyes a minute. Give the controls to the other pilot. The other pilot kind of flies around. You know what they're doing. You, you're getting ready for it. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to open my eyes. and I'm going to be upside down. This is going to be really fun. It, that's not how it really happens. You know, when you're in an upset recovery, and I've been in a couple of them, uh, one I remember in the Air Force, uh, we're flying a non-autopilot type airplane. I'm the instructor. The student's flying. He's a very experienced student and the complacency set in. And I looked down at my um, approach chart and was reading it. When I look back up, we were about passing 90 degrees of bank at 3,000 feet above the ground at night in an unfamiliar territory. And I grabbed the airplane and got us upright. And I said, what happened? And he said, I thought you had the aircraft. Hmm. And I'm like, how, why would you think that? And he, and he said, I thought I heard you say I got it. I said, no, I, I didn't say that. And anyway, it just was a, a breakdown of communication and bad CRM. But at the moment, if, if we had not caught that, it would have been a really, really, you know, terrible event potentially. So, and how did we practice it? In the military, we did a lot of upside down flying. So we always felt like we were prepared for it. In the civilian world, I never really felt like we prepared in a systematic way for, for these events. And so even though, yes, your simulator training could be on the right side of the equation for bow tie, your normal simulator training, I think it's only if it's designed in there properly. It can't be just ad hoc. Yeah, and I think a great example of that, Sonny, is the recent Part 121-423 extended envelope training for the air carriers, where they do require stall prevention and recovery and upset prevention and recovery and very robust guidance in the advisory circulars uh, to do that. And I think to your point as well is the the instructor is really the glue that binds everything together to have a training, a positive training experience. And I think, unfortunately, in this area, to your point, in the civilian world where they don't really operate in the upset domain beyond a certain point, it's really difficult to ask those instructors to try to teach in that domain without specialized training to do it. And then most simulators uh, don't have the ability to determine whether or not the maneuver being conducted is even within the fidelity envelope of the simulator, which would represent, is the simulator actually representing what the real airplane would do? So the good news is, at least in the US uh, and the 121-423 air carrier world, there's advances being made in that. So I think it's exciting times that there is opportunity to improve it. The only other comment that I would make is unfortunately on the simulator side, is it's really missing the potentially incapacitating, char incapacitating characteristics of the human factors associated with a real world upset event. And so, you know, that is going to be a challenge to fully mitigate loss of control using simulation only uh, for yeah. that point. Let me, no, anything you want to add to that, Sonny, before I go to a question we have I, in the in the stream? I, I do, BJ, um, thanks. You know, so um, one of the things we learned uh, when we were, I was on the CAE team when we were developing the Set Falcon 7X program to include the simulators. And that's when I learned that how simulators were built. And, and I think a lot of people like myself at that time, wasn't aware that simulators are built to do specific things. <clears throat> and, and they don't represent the exact airplane. They can't because <clears throat> they're not the real airplane. But to the degree they can, they, they represent the airplane. So <clears throat> the, the, the simulator represents the flight envelopes that were recorded in the actual aircraft and programmed into the sim to do specific things that the training uh, uh, organization wants you to see and practice. But it it doesn't replicate the exact airplane in, in all flight envelopes. The, the data is just not there. At least it wasn't back then. I'm already dating myself, but this was back in 2006. And so we we were asking, hey, we wanted to do this. And the engineers were telling us we don't have the data for that. Sorry, you can't do that. Yeah. And, and I think to your point, the good news on the, for example, on the ICAO manual on upset prevention and recovery training, the new uh, FAA Part 121-423. I don't want to get stuck on the air carriers, but the point is, is that the upset prevention and recovery training is that they need to have what's called an alpha beta plot at the instructor operating station. 
and it shows the existing or current performance of the airplane that's tracking it over history. It shows the flight test data, wind tunnel data, then extrapolated data. So when you're doing upset prevention recovery training, one of the tools that is out there now, but is going to be more prevalent because it's not really readily available, is to see the previous maneuver. Where was the aircraft operating in relation to the alpha beta plot? to see if the simulator was giving a, a fairly accurate representation of the real airplane. So the good news is technology can help, but it doesn't mean it doesn't mean you can't not tear the wings and tail off an airplane and staying within the heart of the envelope. It, it's not about safety. It's about the representation uh, of the airplane. Okay, Sonny, anything to add before I go to a question in the stream here? Nope. All right. I uh, got a great question for Nate. And, you know, this may be more of a conversation than a definitive answer, but I think it's a good one. What will the rating agencies do to incentivize UPRT among 91K and 135 operators? Any thoughts on that, Sonny? Yeah, BJ, you might have a better insight on that. You, you've been working with the regulatory bodies and the international standards bodies for some time on these kind of things. Um, but, you know, I, I, what, I could spin it a little bit and say, what could they do? I, right. I don't know what, 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 what they will do, but, but what they could do is is to incentivize is, is to offer maybe a relief you know um, in, in some other categories of, of currency um, let's say for example if an operator uh, is spending a certain amount of money doing recurrent training for their pilots but they're feeling like there's a diminishing return on this recurrent training it's like checking the boxes they know this airplane they come back from training and we ask how was it yeah it was good did you learn anything yeah not really there's an opportunity. And I think the regulators, if they could offer more flexibility to say, hey, look, you know, you could do UPRT training instead of this just same, same, same again over and over every six months of, of kind of training that you're not receiving uh, that much of return on investment on or benefit from. And I, and I think, BJ, you might have some things in the works like that, you know, uh, as far as um, maybe substitute training, you know, so th that's one thing they could do. Uh, we do, yeah. So if anybody is interested in that, they can certainly reach out to APS on, on ways of trying to get uh, some type of a credit uh, to be able to compensate the costs associated with UPRT. Uh, the other way, Sonny, that it just occurs to me immediately, in fact, it just occurred to me a, a minute ago when you were talking, is that one of the ways that regulatory agencies do this is by requiring mandates, right? And we see this in Europe right now, for example, in EASA, they are mandating on aircraft upset prevention recovery training is just one example. Now, the challenge with the industry, of course, there's tremendous organizational inertia associated with trying to stick to the same process of what they've been doing in the past. So, you know, what we're seeing now uh, in Europe is that flight schools being mandated to implement UPRT are doing it with really uh, inappropriate airplanes, not all attitude or aerobatic capable airplanes with instructors that aren't very trained. And the problem I think is there's such a downward pressure on price is that it now becomes a commodity marketplace. And as soon as that happens, you start getting uh, quality issues as well. So I think that what they can do may not necessarily fix the problem. Having said that, there are progressive operators out there that are doing it right. And so I just don't, I don't wanna throw everybody under the bus, but I think when regulatory mandates show up, there's always a compensation, try to get it done in minimum time with minimum cost. And that, unfortunately, when we're dealing with the number one threat uh, to the environment or to the operations of uh, aviation community, which is loss of control in flight, it usually will require more than the minimum solution, unfortunately. Yeah, and BJ, okay. yes, if, if I could also, and, I, and I, I sensed that, you know, when I was making the comment, it was kind of like a, a tee up for you to do a sales pitch. That wasn't the intent. And, and, I, and I appreciate your, your response to that you, you, you didn't take the opportunity to say, hey, UPRT at APS, we, we have this for you, um, because I understand that, you know, what we're doing today is to to to, you know, promote the, the pure uh, uh, aspects of UPRT and the benefits. What I was getting at is, I think uh, in the works and I, and I think you, you're, you're probably in the forefront of this. Regulatory agencies are open to discuss ways to um, augment training, whether it be through advanced qualification program, AQP, or, or even do an exemption to training so that you can substitute pilot training in different ways to include UPRT into that equation. And it may even be a cost benefit to the operator 
And that's the kind of incentivizing I was thinking of. It's not, this could come from anywhere, whether it be APS or another operator, I'm not trying to do a sales pitch, but, it, but I think operators should be open-minded and say, how can we blend in UPRT into our business that's smart? It's, it's, it's a, it will make our pilots more effective against this threat. And it actually might even help our bottom line if you do it right. I think so. And I agree with that, Sonny. And you're right. This is not a commercially motivated event at all here uh, today. Uh, I will say that, you know, 135 operators uh, often are willing to invest uh, even additional funds, not even cost neutral, but at an expense to be able to mitigate this threat because they see it for what it is and they want to be the safest operator and to compete, you know, at, at higher levels of safety. You know, and that's kind of in the sphere of where Wyvern operates is giving people that safety credential advantage to be able to take uh, opportunities to to be able to improve their capabilities. Okay, so we're down to the last couple minutes here. Let me just take a look. Um, what, so maybe let me just go to this question. So in summary, after the total conversation today um, that you have on bow tie and our, our Q&A so far, Sonny, you know, what does the bow, bow tie model tell us about the importance of UPRT and mitigating loss of control and flight? Well, I think to, for me, I mean, and I've, I've run a, a several bow ties on, on different hazards in the industry. And, and this was the first time when I was doing this presentation to really run it completely as best I could for the moment anyway on, on loss of control and flight. And what the picture told me when I stepped back and looked at it using Flight Safety Foundation uh, uh, model, using the information I had at hand is like on the left side, there's so many things that could lead to, to loss of control and flight. I mean, you know, whether it be fatigue or complacency or, or uh, wind shear, whatever, um, airplane vortice. But on the right side, the, there's, a, there's a few things that, that are available to, to really soften the blow, if you will, or recover the aircraft back to a desirable state. And um, the, the only one really that stood out is to, to recover you back to a desirable state is UPRT. The rest of them, um, the one we don't have yet, there's some fighter jets in the, uh, in, in the inventory that probably have, we were talking about it when I was in the military, the ability to recover itself. Um, you know, but we don't have that in business aviation yet. So otherwise you have the parachute system and, um, and then uh, if you don't have any of this, then it could lead to a, a fatal crash. So it really made it clear that there's many things on the left, many, many threats. You have to set up many barriers, but on the right side, there's very few in the one that stands out that's available for us to do in, in a way that's that's standardized now. You, there, there's all kinds of standardization docs you can look at. There's there's choices you can make to to get this training and how you want to get it. Um, you know, you can always uh, contact somebody in the industry to ask, how, how do I make the right choice? And there's IKO documents. There's all kinds of regulatory documents on upset prevention recovery training, where you can say, as long as my provider meets these criteria, I think I'm probably making a good choice. Yeah, I like that. That's great advice, Sonny. Um, you know, one of the areas, for example, is that uh, on the Cirrus side, uh, I'm personally a Cirrus certified instructor. And we, you know, when it comes to upset prevention recovery training and the CAP system, which is a parachute system, what, what we've seen from time to time is sometimes the pilots get overconfident in their ability to, to use that. And the reality of a real world airplane upset is they can become psychophysiologically incapacitated to actually even be able to reach up and use the handle at times. So there really is a lot to it, um, you know, and then of course the flyby wire flight envelope protections like we're seeing in the Airbus fleet, they are still not as resilient as they could be. In fact, we still see them reverting out of normal law into alternate law and airplane upsets happening where technically they shouldn't because of the technology. Uh, so last item I just wanna bring in for a real quick point would be question here. Unfortunately, a name didn't come through. What would incite a business insurance company to give a bonus? I think very quick answer is the insurance companies are recognizing this and there are progressive insurance companies that are uh, as part of, for example, I'll just use the USAIG Performance Vector Program is they are actually uh, helping their customers pay for or paying for UPRT and so it's in the future. It's growing as an opportunity for insurance companies to start recognizing this threat. So the point is, it's not always just the regulators. So with that, Sonny, I think we're probably going to wrap up here. Any final comments for everybody before we part ways today? Uh, final comments, just, um, you know, to keep, keep looking into this topic, UPRT. It, it is a fundamental threat to, to, to business aviation, and, and it's worthy of your time and effort.
Great. Well, Sonny, thank you so much for your time today and your great presentation and your insights. It's been very valuable. And thank you to everybody out there to join us today out in the real world who's taken time out to watch this session. And with that, Sonny, I thank you, sir. And I look forward to seeing you at our next opportunity. Thanks, BJ.